Have you ever thought about the fact that God is a singing God? I don't know if you knew that, but it's all over the Bible. And if God is a singing God, well, there are tons of implications and applications for you and me. And in this video and the next one, I want to open up the Bible and talk about the God who sings. I'm Zach Hicks, the author of The Worship Pastor, and I run The Worship Pastor's desk as a contributor here at Churchfront. If you'd like to dive deeper into the topics I cover, definitely check out the book linked below and certainly subscribe to the Churchfront channel to help you lead gospel-centered and tech-savvy worship. So this video is part of a, a two-video series. In this video, part one, we're going to look at a few passages, two Psalms, a passage in Ephesians, and a passage in Hebrews. And then the next video, part two, we're going to look at two more sections of Scripture and drive home the topic of our singing God. So as we open up the Word, let's pray. Holy Spirit, thank you for being our singing God. We ask that you would open up the Scriptures to us now. Help us to understand them and drive them deep into our lives and into our hearts and for the sake of our ministries. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to open up our Bibles to a few spots, and first we're going to open up to the Psalms. I want to open up to Psalm 118, verse 14. So go with me there, and let's listen to what Psalm 118, 14 says. It says this, The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Something about a song is so close to the character and essence of God, that God would inspire a poet not just to sing that God is the subject of my song or that God is the object of my song. No, the Lord is my song. Notice, too, a, a common Hebrew poetic device, which is called parallelism. You see it often in the Psalms where you've got two lines right next to each other. And oftentimes the point of them being right next to each other is that one helps interpret the other or redefine the other or say the same thing again. And listen again to what it says. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. There's something to look at with the link between those two things. The fact that God says he is our song and that he is our salvation mean that somehow God as our song and salvation are closely linked. And in the psalm, in a sense, the psalm is saying these mean the same things. There's a connection between salvation and singing. There's a connection between the good news of Jesus for us and God as our song. But let's not miss the fact that in, in one of these worship songs in the scriptures, we've got God saying that he, in fact, is the song that we sing. So there's something very deep and connected and intimate between God and the songs that we sing. Second, I want to turn to Psalm 32, verse 17. This psalm, as you turn there, is a psalm of confession. It's a deep one and a rich one that begins with a, a big shot of thankfulness. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. And they kind of wipe their brow as they say, when I held back my sin, my bones wasted away. That's when I kept silent in verse three. But when I let it all out, when I confessed it to the Lord, the Lord came and renewed me. And it's in the process of confession in this song that we have this verse towards the end, Psalm 32, verse 7. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Some English translations, this is a slippery phrase in Hebrew. This word, uh, rane, means shouts, sometimes songs. And so in various English translation, sometimes you have it being translated as song, sometimes you have being translated shouts. A lot of translators opt for shouts because you've got a lot of battle imagery here between battling sin and battling enemies and being surrounded by enemies, but also in this instance, being surrounded by the love of God in protection against the enemies. And so these shouts of deliverance is kind of like a strong army surrounding a weak uh, attacked person, basically saying, everything's okay, you're going to be saved. But I like the fact 
that it's a little ambiguous between God surrounding us with shouts of deliverance and songs of deliverance, and maybe that ambiguity is purposeful. Maybe that ambiguity is to help us to see that our God who shouts salvation all around us is singing that salvation to us. We'll probably look at some other passages, in fact we will, that will tease out just how how much God sings over us. But I want those two passages of scripture to just sort of hang there for a second as we go to something a little more clear and a passage that we often use when we talk about worship. I want to turn to Ephesians 5 verses 18 to 21. Ephesians 5 verses 18 to 21. If you've been around the worship world and you've heard about New Testament worship, no doubt you've come to this passage. I want us to observe something fresh about it. Listen to God's word in Ephesians 5 18. Do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Part of what we see here is that Paul gives us a command to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And grammatically, this is actually kind of important. He says this central command, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he has a string of participles or I-N-G words that help describe what being filled with the Holy Spirit is. He says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, addressing, singing, making melody, giving thanks, submitting. All those things are fruit and manifestations of the Spirit having filled you and being present. And we shouldn't miss that one of the signs of being filled with the Holy Spirit is singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. And as we read this, the more straightforward idea that we often get taught, which is so true in worship, is that the Holy Spirit fills us. And in that filling, we produce songs that glorify God and edify one another. But once we bring in some of the other passages that we looked at, and even passages that we're going to look at in the next video about our singing God, we want to see that God the Holy Spirit fills us with his own singing and his own song. And maybe part of the payout of hearing that is that because our God is a singing God, when God the Holy Spirit fills us, not only are we empowered to sing our own songs, we get connected to and unified with the song that God sings of glory and of majesty. And as we'll see kind of later, we get connected to the way that the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit work in their joyful song in and with one another. So the final passage I want to go to before we have some takeaways is Hebrews 2, 10 to 12. Hebrews 2, 10 to 12. One of my favorite passages of scripture to go to, go to, to talk about Jesus and singing, especially Jesus in the midst of the congregation. Here's the passage, Hebrews 2, 10. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he, Jesus, is not ashamed to call them, us, brothers and sisters, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. That last bit that I will tell of your name to my brothers is actually a quotation it's a quotation of Psalm 22, 22, and we're going to get back to that a little later in the next video when we talk about the crucifixion of Jesus because that psalm plays in a lot on the lips of Jesus when he's being crucified. But here, the psalm, which is a lament psalm, is being quoted as on the mouth of Jesus in the midst of the congregation, which is kind of language for in the midst of the gathered worship of the people of God. And crazy enough, it says right here that Jesus is not ashamed to call you and me brothers and sisters as he sings with us in the midst of the congregation. And one of the things that I find valuable about this as a worship leader who leads people in worship week after week is that when you do it for special events, when you're leading worship periodically or for like really hype moments, 
you tend to have really uh, euphoric encounters with God. You tend to have great moments with God's people and everybody's there to sing his praises. But when you're a week in, week out worship leader, sometimes it gets harder to see the good moments against the boring moments or the just mediocre moments or just the moments that are part of being a, a broken congregation trying to feel their way toward God week in and week out. That pattern can often wear down on us. And one of the things that I take great comfort in and that I want you to receive comfort in too is the fact that Jesus actively sings when we gather. I think that's something that we miss when we think about the work of Jesus Christ in our life is that we talk about his finished work of life and death on, uh, on the cross and in his life and in his resurrection and all those sorts of things. But we don't often highlight the fact that the book of Hebrews especially points us to the ongoing application of that work in and through his work of singing and of praying and interceding, like Romans 8 says. And I want us to see here very clearly an instance in Scripture where Jesus is singing with us and for us, and we shouldn't miss that. And so maybe that'll give some help and some relief to worship leaders who sometimes feel like we lead our congregations and they look like zombies. I want you sometimes to, to picture the Lord Jesus walking amongst the crowds, wrapping his arms around the people who are mourning, you know, the people who are yawning, looking at their watches or their phones. Jesus is around them singing the better song that they are not singing right then. And Jesus is praising alongside the people who are sold out for him. And even the people who are a little bit skeptical, who aren't entering into the praises of God, somehow Jesus is there in their midst. And guess what? He is perfecting the praises of the people. And as those praises go up, because the Father hears the singing of Jesus, those broken praises through Jesus and through his intercession become sweet and beautiful so take that passage especially, that passage about our singing Lord, and give it to your people and let them know. I want to leave you with four takeaways before we are done with this video. Number one, one of the reasons we sing in worship is simply to mimic and mirror God. If indeed God is a singing God, we reflect bearing his image when we sing. If God sings, it makes sense that we do too. Genesis 1-2 to talks about when God created the world, he created humanity, especially in the sense that he created us and he said not just good, but very good. The rest of the creation is good. Humanity is very good. And one of the things that sets apart humanity from all the other animals and all the other aspects of creation is that we are uniquely creatures made in the image of God. There are a lot of things that that image of God entails and means. People talk about the fact that we're rational creatures and can think. People talk about the fact that uh, we feel in complex ways and relate socially to one another. And all those things certainly are part of what it means to be made in the image of God. But I wouldn't let this slip that part of what being made in the image of God is, is also to mirror and mimic his singing. We could say that singing is a part of what it means to be godly or godlike. To grow in singing, therefore, is to grow in our discipleship. When we sing, we follow Jesus and we follow God. So singing is not an option for Christians. Even if you think you have a bad voice, God has given you a voice to sing, to mirror his own singing. And just the fact that we intone our prayers to God mirrors and reflects his glory, his goodness, and who he is in his essence. The second takeaway I want us to receive, this is a bit more theological, but it has some payout, is that singing is an extremely Trinitarian activity. Sometimes people strain to ask, what's the point of worshiping a triune God? What's the point of believing and affirming that God is one God eternally existing in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? This relational and unified God is active in our singing. God the singer, God the Holy Spirit, as we saw, fills us to sing and fills us with his song. God the singer, God the son, stands among us, singing alongside us the better song that we could never sing anyway. And this should stir our imaginations and draw us into even more worship and wonder to see how active God is in our singing. The Spirit sings, 
Jesus sings, we sing all for their glory and all for the loving pleasure of God the Father. And sometimes it's hard to know where the Spirit begins, where Jesus ends, and where we end, swirled up in the mystery of worship song. To quote one worship song, it's strange and divine, but it's a beautiful reflection and worthy of us meditating on and realizing is going on in the midst of our worship service that the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are actively involved as we gather, and especially as we sing. The fact that God is a singing God, this is the third takeaway, elevates the importance of singing in worship and the importance of everyone doing it. It's kind of an implication of the first thing we said. We should all sing. The fact that God sings means that singing isn't something we can throw away in our worship services. Sometimes in scholarly conversations about worship these days, people rightly point out that maybe we've elevated singing above where we should be celebrating and enjoying other things that God's prescribed in his word for worship, including preaching the word and celebrating the sacraments of the Lord's Supper and baptism. But I wouldn't want that emphasis or that that re-emphasis on those things to minimize the fact that singing is still vital and something that we can't uh, set aside in worship. So everyone should sing. That's a part of it. And the fourth takeaway is the fact that Jesus sings with us and for us means that we don't need to be overly worried about whether God the Father finds our worship acceptable. You see, this is a declaration of the gospel. The fact that Jesus sings for us means that all his merits, all his goodness, all his uh, payment penalty for our sin are applied to our singing. It's as though Jesus is singing the principal note and we're singing a harmony with him such that when God the Father hears those praises, he hears the voice of the same son to whom he declared, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, which means we caught up in Jesus' song receive that same blessing and that same pleasured declaration. You are my daughter. You are my son in whom I am well pleased. Your worship through Jesus, God says, is pleasing to me. It's a sweet sound to my ears. It's It's a wonderful aroma to my nostrils. It's a living sacrifice that I love, God the Father says, and it's all because of the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done. And I think that's a great way to end part one. So stay tuned for part two, where we amplify two more sections of scripture on the amazing theme of our singing God. Thanks for watching. Check out the description for other worship ministry resources. Subscribe to the channel, and we will see you next time.